Buenos días a todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good night's rest after the intense work. Yesterday, this is the second day of the doctoral seminar, Carlos Quinto European Award Cultural Roots of the Council of Europe, Culture, Heritage, History, and Memory for the Promotion of European Values, Integration, and Peace. Today is a very busy day with four presentations, and the first one by Javier Matamoros Becerra from the University of Extremadura on the proposal to generate common spaces to combat ultranationalism by eradicating hate speech and promoting European values. And the uh, presenter will be Anna Milosevic. Um, and I like her website because he, she's known in the academic community as a monument hunter. She did that yesterday in Jarandilla too, from a nuclear blast zone to black magic rights sites. She visits unusual and often macabre places to study how individuals and societies mourn and commemorate. Currently, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the Leuven Institute of Criminology at the QL Leuven Faculty of Law. And her research takes a bird's eye view and a wide variety of roles assigned to memorialization processes. It zooms on the post-terrorist memorialization in Europe in order to critically examine its effectiveness for the victims, their families, and the survivors. She's actively working as an expert, a consultant, and memorialization in transitional justice, prevention, and countering of violent extremism with different stakeholders. From the Radicalization Awareness Network, so you are closely linked to the paper that is going to be presented right after in the EU Commission and think tanks, victims, organizations, and local and national governments. And I'm proud to say that Anna is part of the Youth Alumni, the Youth Foundation's alumni. So she was one of the students, one of the grantees of this uh, prize a few years ago. And as our director said yesterday, we're very proud of her work and to have her here collaborating with the foundation. Thank you. Have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, of all, thank you for your very uh, detailed presentation of uh, my work. And also, um, I want to emphasize how grateful I am to be here today uh, as an alumni of, uh, of USTE, and to be in the position also to discuss papers of many brilliant young researchers. Um, my task today, this morning, is to present Javier <laughs> and to give you a short introduction about what he's going to talk about today. So I'm going to uh, use this very brief time uh, to do that. Um, Javier is uh, used his own because uh, he did his uh, degree here in Extremadura, and currently he is uh, being a doctoral student as well here in the University of Extremadura. Um, his paper is going to um, talk about the attitudes towards the migrants, and he's going to examine the links that these attitudes towards the modern day immigrants have within the um, ultranationalist ideology. So why I think this paper is really uh, very, very interesting and why you should really uh, be very uh, attentive into listening to Javier's presentation is because within the overall, let's say, objective, uh, uh, overall theme of this doctoral seminar, which is culture, heritage, history, and memory, uh, we need to have a discussion as well on immigration. 
because immigration is interwoven into the fabrics of the European Union. And we have to remember that before the Euro stars and before the Erasmus stars, uh, the first border movers in the European uh, community were the blue collar migrants. Within the creation of the European coal and steel uh, community, we had many, many migrants coming from European territory and outside European territories that were the ones that actually built the European Union. So without further ado, uh, Javier, come and uh, let us hear uh, your presentation. Good morning, everyone. I would like to use uh, a few minutes of my speech to thank the organization for giving me this uh, grant. And secondly, for having organized this conference because, well, I, I knew you already because uh, this is the fourth time um, I'm here at Houston, and well, this was uh, it was always delicious, and I took this opportunity to come back from the United States to Extremadura, which is uh, my place, my place of origin, and the place that I chose to study and work. And I also want to thank you, the experts because the amount of advice you've given to my colleagues yesterday during the seminar and in, during the coffee breaks and lunch and dinner breaks uh, was really helpful. So even if the layout makes us think that we are um, opposing each other, it is not true. And I also want to congratulate my colleagues who presented their um, work yesterday because they were magnificent. And well, now I will start my, my speech. Well, you see the name of my conference, Proposal to Generate Common Spaces to Combat Internationalism by Eradicating Hate Speech. Uh, I'm promoting European values. So this speech or this communication is part of my PhD dissertation that is called Analysis of the Relationship Between the Economic Globalization and the Rise of Ultranationalist Parties in Western Europe. And this is the structure I'm going to use, which is quite canonical. First of all, I will introduce you to the goal of the presentation, then an introduction, the uh, concept framework. I want to talk about why I'm using the term ultranationalism and not another one. What's the ideological framework of ultranationalism in Western Europe? The positioning of the ultranationalist parties about immigration. I will talk about immigration as a driver for the support to ultranationalist parties. And I will also talk about the theory of threats in, uh, in the psychology field, why an immigrant is perceived as a threat. Then I will talk about the methodology, the results, the conclusions, and the bibliography. The goal of my communication is to make a proposal within the culture roots of the Council of Europe to create a route on immigration. With the participation of people who are prone to channel their frustration on globalization by supporting ultranationalist parties. So we want to find the 
um, pockets of population that is prone to support internationalist parties. Um, in order to to find the immigration or sorry the pockets or the niches of population, I have paid attention to regions or provinces with high percentages of immigrants. Um, by uh, analyzing the background or the context, we have seen that immigration is a fundamental driver for the uh, support to alternationalist parties. So we have used the NATS 2 and NATS 3 levels in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean Europe, Spain, Greece, Italy, and Portugal. I finally have focused in uh, Spain, Italy, and Greece, not Portugal, and I will explain later why. As um, um, it has been said also during the opening speech, I think I heard that one of the uh, lines of work of the Council of Europe is uh, immigration routes with the youth. And I will mention it now, so I was very happy to hear it. The goal of my proposal is to try and interact with migrants where there is a higher increase of immigrant population, where in places where there are waves of immigration. We are seeing it in southern Europe at Ceuta, Melilla, in Lampedusa, and Lesbos Islands. What's the objective? In order to use the uh, sociological theory of contact, when we interact with people, even if they are um, foreign to us, to our daily lives, when we are in touch with them, when we understand their problems, the um, tribulations they have lived, their issues, we are less prone to see them as a threat, as an issue. So through this immigration route, we could interact with people who have struggled to come to Europe, who had um, covered many kilometers and have to pay mafias because when we interact with people and become aware of their problems, we are less prone to see them as a threat. We are less likely to see them as a threat. This is the sociological theory of contact that justifies all this work. What are the references? about this type of routes or itineraries. Well, the social affairs minister has created the routes to exile. This summer, there will be the second edition of these routes. It is a route composed of all the trails that use the um, the Spanish Republicans to flee to France through Navarre and the Pyrenees or through the Altamborda in Girona. These routes are on food and especially for the youth. I think it's only for people under 26 or under 30 or something like that. And the objective is to make them aware of the um, tribulations that thousands of people who fled um, Spain uh, during the Civil War experienced. And there is um, a parallel route in uh, Europe, the uh, liberation route in Europe. It's a network of region that's specially affected by the Nazi regime at the end of the Second World War. This route was created 
with the purpose of making people aware of the Nazi regime and the history, the recent history of Europe, so as not to make them make mistakes again. And this is the last part of my objectives. This proposal must be specially designed for young people. Why? Two reasons for this. First of all, because they are the influencers or the opinion leaders now. They will also be the leaders of tomorrow. And for another reason, you know that in elections, votes to autonationalist parties has the shape of a U, of an U. Normally, they're voted for by uh, all the elderly and the youth. So that's why in U. That's why this is specially designed for the youth, because they are influencers, they will be leaders, and because they're specially likely to vote for ultranationalist parties together with the elderly. As you can see in the work of these two experts, Alzheimer and Lubbers. I just want to mention, to briefly mention two short things. Between 2011 and 2019, there's been a rise in ultranationalist parties in Europe, even in southern Italy, in southern, in southern Europe, but for Italy. For example, nobody thought that Spain was going to vote for an ultranationalist party, or for example, Greece. And there were um, election two weeks ago in Spain, and ultranationalist parties participate now in coalitions, and they set their own agenda, and they influence the national agendas. So I'm going to summarize the situation of all the ultranationalist parties in Southern Europe. These are the. This is the result of the. European Parliament elections in 2019, you see the countries where there were most votes. The most votes was uh, the United Kingdom and Italy. We can understand the situation of the UK because it was after the Brexit, uh, before the exit came into force, and that's why they could vote, and they voted for the Brexit the Brexit party. The second party was Italy. Uh, we have at least two internationalist parties there, Lega and Fratelli d'Italia. And then France and uh, Austria. So today, one of the main economic powers in Europe, Italy, is governed by an, an openly ultranationalist party. The president of the Congress, Giorgia Meloni, is the leader of Fratelli Italia, and the vice president is a member of Lega, Matteo Salvini. In France, in 2002, it came as a surprise to see Le Pen's father, the old Le Pen, to see to to see how he got around 10% of all the votes 20 years ago. And uh, Marine Le Pen got 33, 34% of votes and making it to the second round. It is not uh, a surprise anymore. Even Portugal, who seemed um, immune to ultranationalism, in November 2022, Chega got 7% of the votes. Even in the Scandinavian countries, such as Sweden, Denmark, Norway, who seem to be immune to ultranationalism, and even the leader, Senna Marin, the uh, 
leader of Finland in April 2023, got outranked by the ultranationalist parties because she ranked third and the uh, ultranationalist party ranked second, even if Sanna Marin was a very popular leader. So today, ultranationalism is present in almost all political arenas in the European Union. I'm going to talk about the concepts. Concepts. Why I'm using this term, ultranationalism, because there are many labels, many possible labels for the type of parties: radical parties, uh, far way, um, far right parties, right-wing parties, neo-fascist parties, nationalist parties. I prefer to use ultranationalism because for me, radical right is only showing that it's an extreme change in the political and economic arenas, which is like saying nothing. Um, extremist party, well, it's more or less the same but it doesn't take into account the liberal democratic system. Populism is um, on vogue after the Rovira Calvas and Moody's works, but we use it excessively, even if it's empty, because it only shows that they used to antagonic layers in the society to try and find a solution that is simple for complex problems. But populisms need an ideology. So populism per se is totally empty. National populism, maybe, but populism per se is totally empty. And what about fascism? Well. Everything is fascism, nothing is fascism, because fascism is about using violence. We cannot find them um, except for a golden dawn in Greece, which, is, which, which became illegal in 2020 because it's totally violent and because it's uh, considered to be a criminal party. But um, nobody's using violence right now, um, like the period between the wars. Societies now uh, have gotten rid of violence and the use of violence in the political arena. And another term that is sometimes used is nationalist. But nationalism, among other things, ambitions a priority of a nation state. But that priority of a nation state can be interpreted from two different perspectives, a civic nationalism, meaning we want the nation state to be a priority, or an uh, uh, ethnicity priority. We want the nation state to be a priority, but that nation state can only be composed of native elements, people or ideas that are original from that nation state. That is the uh, right definition or the exact description of these parties in Western Europe. That's why I call it ultra-nationalism, in order to make them, to set them apart from a civic nationalism. Because I'm only talking about the ethnic nationalism. So what's the ideological framework of this type of parties? They um, reject globalization because they supposedly want to support just the national work or the domestic work. And they also want to get a hold of this nation state sovereignty which, uh, and not discipline national institutions. So as a consequence, they reject immigration. And as a consequence, they also reject more or less multiculturalism. Specifically, and I don't know why 
this is showing up like this. This is not what I had prepared. Well, you can see the, the colors, but each of these numbers represent, represents um, um, ultranationalist party in Europe. And I wanted to show you the differences in their ideological position between the moderate right, the Christian right, and the ultranationalist parties. The, The parties to the left are the Dima Christian parties, and that's how they position themselves towards immigration and refugees in Europe. And then the preponderance on, of their tenets regarding immigration in Western Europe. And the parties to the right are the ultranationalist parties. And in this slide, I wanted you to see the difference between the ultranationalist parties in Southern Europe as opposed to the Dima Christian parties. The ultranationalist parties reject immigration in a more intense way. And they also insist on their electoral programs to this. They are more restrictive on the issue on immigration, and they also make it sure that people know about that, as opposed to the Christian Democrat parties. So here we can see the, um, the supply and demand, why people vote for ultranationalist parties. They are cross-sectional and longitudinal, national and supranational studies, and they all reach the same conclusion. Immigration and the percentage of immigration is a driving factor, is a driver to vote for ultranationalist parties. And now there is a higher tendency to vote for ultranationalist parties in areas with lots of immigration if the unemployment rates are also high. Another driver to vote for immigration parties, sorry, for internationalist parties, is that social expenses are also high. Why? I want to check now about the theory of threat. The theory of threat is an attempt to explain why regions or provinces with lots of immigration tend to vote for ultranationalist parties. According to this theory, when resources are scarce, when it is not easy to find a job, or when your salary is not very good, or when there are a lack of social expense, Immigration is perceived as a threat to my particular um, individual situation. And additionally, ultranationalist parties can benefit from this if an immigrant is perceived as a threat for the liberal social system in Europe. For example, Le Pen is telling the French population, I'm not against immigration. I am against of immigrants who take immigrants who break the liberal state in France. Le Pen is trying to make people perceive immigration as a threat towards the French culture. And as a consequence, areas with the highest numbers of immigration tend to vote for ultranationalist parties. I'm going to explain now the methodology of used. Um, 
I'm trying to link in the support for ultranationalist parties to the numbers of immigrants. High numbers of immigrants and high uh, percentage of votes for ultranationalist parties. In those cases, surgical actions are proposed. In those cases, I proposed initiatives such as the immigration route. In regions with high immigration and low support for ultranationalist parties, I propose to use preventive actions. For example, immigration routes, yes, so, so people are aware of the tribulations immigrants leave. And and third place, there are regions with uh, low immigration rates and high support for in ultranationalist parties. And in these cases, I recommend using case studies, performing case studies. What's going on in there? For example, we have the case of uh, the Macedonian regions in northern Greece. As you know, there was a problem between the um, state of northern Macedonia and the state of Greece uh, for the term, the name, northern Macedonia, because in northern Greece, Western, sorry, Eastern and Central Macedonia in September 2019 decided to vote for ultranationalist parties. Do you think this is uh, logical? Yes, it is, because that case, we, we did, uh, we should do a, a case study because we don't think the problem there is not is linked to immigration. It is linked to that problem uh, of the name Macedonia. So in those cases where there is low immigration rates but high uh, ultranationalist support, we need to perform a case-by-case -case study. What about the number of ultranationalist parties in Europe? In Spain, we have Fox. In Greece in 2019, there were two parties that got uh, representation in the European Parliament, um, Golden Dawn and the Greek Solution. Golden Dawn is now illegal. In Italy, we have Lega, uh, Lega Norte in the past, and Fratelli d'Italia. And in Portugal, we got Chega. In order to measure the support for internationalist parties, I've been using the European Parliament elections 2019 for a series of reasons. Those were the less, the most recent elections of the European Parliament. And um, I reject using surveys because in surveys, people normally do not show their um, politically incorrect preferences. And voting for an internationalist party is perceived as politically incorrect, so people would lie. So that's why I prefer to use uh, real elections. And the uh, parliament elections are good because the entry thresholds are low. In Spain, we have many constituencies, as many constituencies as provinces, but you know that the law, the Dom's law, uh, makes it uh, not proportional. So a vote is a person is not a vote, or a province not a vote. But in the European Parliament elections, it is almost 100% proportional, correlate, because the entry threshold is very low. And another advantage is that they are performed simultaneously across the European Union. And the last elections were in 2019, so it was pre-COVID. I've been focusing on Southern Europe because it, it was a region that was not uh, affected by internationalist parties except the uh, except Southern Italy. That's why it hasn't been extensively studied because Vox 
got representation in a parliament only in 2018, in Chega, in Portugal only recently. So historically, support for nationalist parties uh, has been low, and they have been consequently uh, never studied. In, and also because they share common futures. For example, there were recent dictatorships. There is a whole and strong array of Christian democratic Christian Democrat parties. The, re, the democratic systems were established in recent past. There wasn't a welfare state after the Second World War. They joined the European Union in the 80s. They were the main beneficiaries of the uh, European aid uh, until the big enlargement towards the Eastern Europe. And they were severely affected by the Great Recession. And what is the methodology I'm using to use the regional and the provincial levels? In Spain, I'm using not two, 17 regions. In Greece, I should have been using a provincial level, but I wasn't able to get access to the provincial level information, so I had to use regional data in Italy. Not three they gave me enough uh, information, so I'm using that two and that three. And in Portugal, I should have been using that three to 25 uh, sets of data because seven was too low, too little. But I had some issues with Portugal. For example, the first one being that Sega was very recent. Um, it only started to rise in January 2022. That was the first time they got representatives in the Portuguese parliament. Secondly, there is no correlation in Portugal between the constituencies with two, not two, and not three, because in Portugal we find constituencies 18 in uh, the continent, and then two and two. But NAS2 is seven, and NAS3 is 25. So there is no statistical uniformity that I could use. And then the uh, percentages of immigration is only given for NAS2 levels. So we, the uh, disaggregation was not enough. It was only um, disaggregated on the level of NATS2. So I decided to exclude Portugal from this study. I only focused on Spain, Italy, and Greece. Let's see the results. You can see here three maps of Spain. And the top, you can see figure number two, the support for ultranationalist parties in 2019. And then you can see the uh, variation between 2019 and 2011. It is the period of the highest rise of the support to um, to nationalist parties, and then the percentage of immigrants. As you can see, the variation of immigrants is not directly correlated to the uh, support to these groups. But it really correlates with something else, with the absolute numbers of immigrants. But look at the uh, territories that vote for a civic nationalism, when there is a desire, uh, more intense or less intense, to develop a, a nation state, Catalonia and the Basque Country. In those cases, there is um, minimum support towards the ultranationalist parties. Look at Girona, Lleida, the provinces with the highest numbers of immigrants, relative numbers. But then in Catalonia, the ultranationalist party didn't get much support, didn't get many votes. And uh, the situation is uh, similar in the Basque Country. So this suggests that 
provinces with a civic ultranationalism are less prone to vote for ultranationalist parties. And as per my methodology, and with a, what would you choose, a surgical or a preventive approach? What are the provinces that need a surgical or a preventive approach? based on the numbers of immigrants and the support towards the ultranationalist parties. What are the needs? Malaga, Granada, and Rioja need a preventive approach. And the uh, provinces or not three level constituency that need a surgical approach, meaning high immigration, high support, would be Ciuta, Melilla, Almeria, Murcia, and Madrid. Let's talk about Greece. This is Greece. It is not configured because uh, each of the sets of islands is, uh, is a constituency, so we have joined them together. I know you wouldn't recognize their Greece. In Greece, in 2019, there was Golden Dawn, Golden Dawn, sorry, and on the other hand, the Greek solution. Golden Dawn and Greek solution in northern Greece got most votes. In the central and eastern Macedonia regions due to the conflict, even if it's only because of the name. That was the fact that made the Zurita government fall in 2019 because the annual party stopped uh, supporting them. So if we compare the support to Creek Solution and Golden Door to the percentage of immigration in those areas, we can see that in the Macedonia regions, they are getting more votes. They got more votes than they should. So it wasn't linked to the issue of immigration. It was only linked to probably the name issue, but we should form our study case in there. That was maybe the cause for the highest support. And then look at the islands, the archipels, the ones that got waves of immigration, such as Lesbos, would need a surgical approach because they support the internationalist parties and there is a direct coloration between the two aspects. So they would benefit from a surgical approach and a preventive approach in the southern Aegean and the Ionian islands. And then we move on to Italy. What's the situation in Italy? What's the situation like? There are two ultranationalist parties. On the one hand, Fratelli d'Italia and Lega, on the other hand. Lega, who, which until recently, was called Lega Norte and was mainly focused on northern Italy, the area they call it uh, Padania, um, north to the Po River. They wanted to create a fictional state. But since they wanted to get more votes for all the for um, all the Italians, so they decided to change their name to just Lega. But their votes come predominantly from northern Italy, north of River Po. And then, 
it is offset by the support given to Fratelli d'Italia in southern Italy. Meloni is um, especially popular in Rome, in Rome. The image is completely different from the one projected by Lega. So they complement each other because uh, their areas of influence are totally distributed among them. And if we sum up the if we sum the support obtained by Lega and Fratelli d'Italia, well let's focus on the correlation with the number of immigrants. We we see a high correlation. But look at northern Italy in the Bolzano and well, that's basically that, the Bolzano region. There's something going on in there, similar to the Catalonia and Basque country regions in Spain. They um, identify themselves with being nation states, so they channel the support towards internationalist parties through the creation of um, sovereign states. So they have what they call civic nationalism. And the approach that we should be using in these areas in Italy would be as follows. The surgical area that would uh, benefit northern Italy would be most beneficial in Veneto, Lombardia, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, and Piemont. And then the preventive, cert, the preventive um, approach would be most beneficial for Tuscany and Emilia, Romagna, which lies southern, south to these four regions. That is. Uh, nationalist, but it's not channeling the nationalism through these parties. And these are my conclusions. I can confirm there is a relationship between immigration and support for ultranationalist parties in Southern Europe, or at least in Spain, Italy, and Greece. So I have uh, launched some proposals of niches on to which um, create raising awareness, raising activities about immigration, and that civic nationalism tries to compensate or tends to compensate the support for ultranationalism. Thank you. Bueno, os dejo un pequeño aparto de referencias en el que haya basado. Un pequeño. Three, yeah. Okay, thank you, Javier, for this uh, beautiful presentation, and um, and really, uh, you really went into um, into detail. Let's say uh, I'm really impressed by your knowledge of uh, of Italian regions, especially. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so just um, let's say a, a brief reflection uh, on the paper that you wrote uh, and your presentation, because uh, in the paper you mainly uh, speak uh, about Spain, and today we have seen a more of a comparative perspective, mm -hmm. uh, bringing data from other countries such as Italy, Portugal, and and Greece. And it's um, let me say it's a quite um, quite an interesting study, I, I must say, um, to uh, compare, uh, let's say, the the attitudes towards uh, migrants in the Mediterranean region that has been very much. Uh, in the political debate over the last years. Uh, so a couple of reflections. Um, we have seen at the beginning of your presentation that you spoke, uh, you tried to define this ultra-nationalism. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you listed a different kind of, um, let's say, uh, systems or symptoms of what can be called ultra-nationalism. Mm -hmm. But then, 
Um, I think that your presentation and your paper could have benefited more uh, by examining those political parties and their own attitudes towards migrants because you never actually brought that into connection. You just made your own definition of ultranationalism mm -hmm. and then selected parties according to your own criteria without mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. explaining maybe to us mm -hmm. why those parties in specific uh, reflect that mm -hmm. your definition. Mm -hmm. For instance, for the um, uh, political elections in the European Parliament in 2019, you could have brought more evidence of how these parties use immigration in the political discourse, mm -hmm. in the political debates, in relation to other political parties, mm -hmm. to make a better case as to why you have selected these political parties uh, at the first place. <clears throat> so um, I'm also... I understand your decision to actually look at the elections in the European Parliament in 2019 makes perfect sense. Um, but it's also important to understand the broader dynamic of the European Parliament's elections, mm -hmm. which are quite different mm -hmm. than the elections mm -hmm. in, in one's own country. Mm -hmm. And the political discourse is different, the actors are different, mm -hmm. the audiences are different, uh, political parties when they participate in national political elections, mm -hmm. uh, they um, do not uh, account for the global uh, family of political parties mm -hmm. at the European level. So there is this link also in shaping the, um, the political campaign of national political parties mm -hmm. for the European uh, um, elections. So I'm also interested whether you have looked um, these specific political parties mm -hmm. in four countries mm -hmm. and their membership mm -hmm. in European political groups, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially ties with the European, European People's Party. That's really interesting mm -hmm. because uh, somebody yesterday, uh, I think it was you, uh, that mentioned that we have a minister. It's actually a, a Greek commissioner for the European way of life, or as I call it, the EPP way of life. So that's interesting because they have a really strong position on migration. They have always mm. uh, had. Um, in terms of uh, immigration, so that's my next point, um, you do not operationalize actually what migration means. Immigration means actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. So what kind of data uh, did you yeah. use? I see that you used the data from the Ministry of Interior for the political um, elections, that you, ha you have used your own data from the Statistical Office of uh, uh, Spain, that you use secondary data from another researcher mm -hmm. in the case of uh, Greece, yes, yes. Schaffer and others, yeah. This is the presentation uh, of support for ultranationalist party, not for immigration. Okay, well, I must have, yeah, not seen that. Uh, in, in, well, in any case, uh, when you talk about immigration and the data that you use in four different countries, so also the definition of immigration and the data that mm. you use has to be same in those four okay. countries. So the data that, for instance, you got from Spain, does it cover illegal migrants, mm. undocumented mi migrants, people of foreign origin? So these are all the subtleties and different kind of interpretation of what migration actually means and the data that these institutes collect from certain regions. Mm. And how can you account for that? That's um, a question or a reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, two more things uh, very fast on Greece. Um, did, you, um, did you consider that in the, um, in the case of Greece, in the northern region of the Greece especially, mm -hmm. there is a bilateral dispute going on with the northern, uh, North Macedonia? Mm -hmm. So maybe those data are not just, cannot just be connected to the immigration, but to something else, to the existing bilateral disputes. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe at yeah, the last point, mm -hmm. uh, the very last point, um, how important is the, uh, the entry point of clandestine migration 
in these four countries. So in the regions, in the cities, in the islands that are entry point for illegal immigration, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so what, is the, um, what, is the, what are your results in these specific areas? Mm -hmm. How can you account for the results in these specific areas? Okay. For instance, I have seen, uh, I come from Calabria. <laughs> it's really southern Italy. And we have illegal migrants coming mm. every day, as mm. you have seen also in the news. Uh, uh, even Ursula von Leiden was, uh, was in Calabria recently with Meloni, mm -hmm. uh, with a helicopter overseeing mm. my house. Mm. Or, and um, we have uh, seen that Meloni won a lot of uh, mm. votes in my region, which mm. is an entry point for clandestine uh, migration. So mm. yeah. yeah, I would be interested in hearing that. Muchas gracias, eh, Ana. Maybe, eh, Thank you very much, Ana. Maybe you'd like to. Shall we move on to the questions, or maybe we can move to the questions uh, straight away? Can, shall we give you four minutes to respond very briefly? Teresa, you'd be next. I completely agree with you in all your point. Actually, uh, in almost of the point is something that was in mind. Not only was in mind, but was taken into account, but maybe, maybe not for sure, it wasn't described in the paper and in the presentation because of a matter of time, I mean. But all the information, almost all the information that you have asked now uh, is designed. Is designed and there is a background in order to to support what I said, why uh, I have selected some political party, for example. I have selected this political party because they are in the same uh, political family in the European Parliament, because previous authors used these political parties as an example of ultranationalist parties. But I completely agree in that point. Um, I also agree with you, with you, and it's something that I didn't take into account, that the election to the European Parliament it's like a secondary election, less important than general, than national election, than local election, that maybe at this point it's useful at least to say or at least to note there is some particular issues in the case of uh, European election different from general election. Uh, for example, the main thing is that uh, there are more people that vote in general election that, in Europe, that for the European Parliament. That can be something to note. Um, I also agree with you that uh, I only said immigration, and I didn't explain what I want to say with immigration. It's percentage of, of immigration, but for sure I should explain more about what I'm saying, what I'm referring to in immigration, something to take into account for the for the paper, for the definitive paper. Um, I try to explain that in the case of the north of Greece, it can be a case study because for sure, or at least it seems that uh, in this election, uh, this region voted for a ultra nationalist party at least more than other parties in Greece because the conflict with Northern Macedonia. I tried to explain that, maybe it wasn't as clear as I wanted. But I suggested that uh, this issue could be a reason because of that, uh, they voted for Golden Tower. Can you turn the mic? It's uh, number three. 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 Yeah. Yeah, but that actually is my case. So how can you connect the mm -hmm political uh, voting behavior okay. to immigration if you did not examine the political content, mm -hmm. the content uh, of the, the, the elections. So if a political party uh, campaigned for something in that specific region mm -hmm. in relation to something very specific, then you can make a connection. Okay. Otherwise, it's just an assumption. Okay. Yeah. Just connecting the okay. dots by yourself okay. without actually looking at the political content okay. of the uh, of that specific campaign of that specific election. So this needs to be really, mm -hmm. really, really tied to uh, to 
those two variables. For this case or generally speaking? No, in generally okay, speaking, generally speaking. Because otherwise it's just, you are applying your own definition to these political parties. Yeah. You are just assuming without proving that they actually deemed immigration crucial in their political campaign in mm -hmm. 2019 because mm -hmm. we are looking that year. Okay. Right? I understand. Uh, I tried to show in the figure that, I don't know why, uh, it wasn't expressed what I wanted because that uh, the political party, the Ultranationalist political party, at least in this four country, uh, tending to be more restrictive through, uh, in the case of immigration and also try to put this point as more relevant. But for sure, I must give more information finally, yeah. in the final. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Eh, Teresa, por favor. Yeah, just a second. You didn't respond to me about the, the question about the entry points um, in the countries yeah. of the Mediterranean, because yeah. that is crucial if we're yeah. talking about yeah. migration and the attitudes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, actually, I put the example of Lesbos in the case of Greece, uh, or in the case of the Egeo Island, as uh, a point that uh, chirurgical action should be taken, and also in the case of Spain, Ceuta and Melilla, because in this region there are more immigration because these waves, and also more support for the trans party. So for sure is Yeah, but that is contradictory to your research findings, because for instance, I looked very carefully in my own region, Calabria. So as okay. I said, like the Meloni got a lot of votes there, mm -hmm. okay? Calabria is also an entry point. Mm -hmm. Very important one. Mm -hmm. There are, as mm -hmm. I said, like migrants coming coming every day. Mm -hmm. But what did the results show, actually? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, it's a completely completely different story then. Okay. Okay. So, si. <laughs> si, hola. Uh, a ver. Mm, ha escogido usted un tema. You picked a very interesting topic. It is an interesting topic and also very complex. And in that topic, um, I, I think that you have the right focus except for one thing, and that is when you create the concept of civic nationalism and you oppose it to ultra-nationalism. If you look at the ideological framework of ultra-nationalism, and you have two slides about that, then you see that the indicators or the metrics you use um, match almost all of the nationalistic um, parties in some r Spanish regions. Rejection of uh, globalization, uh, recovery of um, certain powers, nativism, rejection to immigration, rejection to multiculturalism. If you look at the political programs and also the practice, what's, happen what's been happening in the past 15 years uh, in some of these regions, especially in Catalonia, also in the Basque Country, although it is not that visible there. Well, if you look at that, we are not seeing civic nationalism. There was ethnic cleansing where many people had to leave. We had to leave the country for some time. Then we had the possibility to come back, but we had to leave first. There was a coup d'etat that was stopped, but it was declared when two disconnection laws uh, was, uh, were approved and an illegal uh, declaration of independence. And there was an institutional exclusion of everything that is uh, nationalism within the institutions, even the civic institutions. So I don't see how, well, there is an ex explanation why this civic nationalism has stopped ultranationalism. And it is ultra-nationalism, but it is just a branch of it. And it is a branch that has uh, a minority included that is never even one third of uh, the election's census. So 
So there is not a way to consider that what we are facing is what you call civic nationalism. You might call it differently, and I might agree to that if you call it differently, but not that's for sure not civic nationalism. Yes, you can, you can answer now, and then we give the floor to Enrique. Thank you very much for your comments. And I would like to know the terms you would use, because it would be very useful to me. And if you say that, it must be so. But I personally, and I might be wrong, because according to well, from where I hear from you, you are well experienced. So I, <laughs> but anyway, it is obvious, or it seems obvious to me after what I hear. It is from what I get. It is it won't show that distinction between uh, ethnic and civic nationalism, and especially that importance in the elections message. If you have other references, I would appreciate to know what they are to complete my study. And especially, I would like to know about your experience, both academic experience and also life experience. I would I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me start by congratulating you for uh, this uh, presentation, both your pres the, the presentation itself and also the paper and also the research behind. And according to the rationale of this uh, seminar, we're going to give you some comments and reflections that's going to be helpful for you and your colleagues as well. And like my uh, colleague Teresa, I would recommend you and anyone else to think of the words by following a rationale, a, a traditional Arist Aristotelian rationale. You claim that uh, ultranationalism is a core concept in your research. Well, strictly, strictly speaking, in terms of logic and uh, language, it is an empty concept because it is uh, two elements with a uh, name and a description. You have an, a substantive, a noun, and an adjective. Ultra is the Latin version of meta, and it means that it goes beyond something. And the noun nationalism if you define something with an absurd, it is like saying that uh, historical memory is not you cannot it's a round circle it's a square circle it's a fright no it doesn't make any sense so how do you construct that word also for Spanish. It is a noun with an adjective. You have to pick the class, gender, and species, not the other way around. You say that it can't be radical nationalism. Why? It, it makes sense from the point of view of logic and grammar. Extreme nationalism. In the 19th century, it was called divinized or goat-like nationalism because that nation is supported by the idea of, a, of, a, of God. It is a substantive nationalism. Um, there are many ways, but ultra-nationalism seems to be, it is absurd. It is like when you hear that you need to learn to learn. Why don't you go over it? Why do you, don't you learn to learn to learn? Learning is learning. Learning to learn is just learning. And if you say seven times, it's going to be learn. It doesn't change if you say learning to learning to learning to learn. Uh, like Teresa said before, which is also very important, there are some English-speaking studies You use the criteria of civic nationalism versus ethnic nationalism. That's a different version from 1949 to the um, 
divide between regional nationalism for political region, uh, reasons and cultural nationalism. I think that divide is quite complex because political nationalism due to p political cultures create their own culture and cultural nationalism has uh, s political subjects behind. But beyond that, even if we assume that there is not a clear divide, your application sometimes have uh, too many pre-assumptions that are not very uh, clear. The example is the distortion in Lerida and the Basque Country. Substantivized and nationalist, ethnic, uh, radicalized, and uh, is, uh, that's clear in the Basque Country. And in Catalonia, uh, Teresa can tell you what some of us know, which is huge. So to what extent that criteria only applies to Vox in Spain? You have to look into your uh, definitions, and then you might see things you don't want to see, but they are there. Thanks, Enrique. I've seen many hands up. We still have 17 minutes. We'll, let's try and give everyone the opportunity to speak from both sides, from the researchers and the experts. Thank you very much for your presentation. I've enjoyed this uh, very much because I also work with uh, this type of political actors. My question is related to the terms you use for them. You have a slide where you explain why ultra-nationalism and then you rule out others such as uh, radicalism, populism, fascism, on nationalism, on, on extremism and fascism, we can rule it out, no doubt, I believe. But the, the parties you analyze is uh, extreme right, uh, extremist country. And all of them, except for uh, Golden Dawn, they are all right wing uh, populist countries. So I don't know to what extent that ultranationalism is needed when there is already a defined term. You mentioned Cas Mude and Cristobal Rovira Calabase, and they themselves use this concept of extreme right populist country. They do not say that populism doesn't mean anything. That's like Klaus' strategy, saying that populism it is not does not mean anything, claiming that uh, uh, populism has some basic ideas of the people against the elites and that's, uh, uh, that's uh, glued or linked to an, a larger ideology. And here you're mentioning uh, parties that are uh, right-wing parties, but they are also populists. This goes beyond the traditional um, divide, left, right. Maybe you might use a different terms. Regarding also nationalism, I think that that divide between nationalism, uh, ethnic and civic nationalism does not apply. I, uh, maybe independent, independentist nationalism would be more appropriate because the three element you, elements you mentioned, uh, Catalonia, Basque Country, and Trentino Alto Adige, do have very strong uh, uh, nationalist movements. It's not that they're not nationalist. Uh, they, uh, and finally, very briefly, you speak about the contact theory and the psychological theory of threats. I would like to ask you about your opinion of the great replacement theory, which is very much related to immigration for this uh, type of uh, parties. I'm not saying uh, this is true. I'm saying that they claim uh, it is true, and uh, it takes a very important position for these parties. Thank you very much. Would you like to answer to this question, especially the last one, the one on the, your opinion? Or I knew that the difference between civic nationalism and uh, ethnic nationalism was going to be quite controversial, especially in the case of Spain. So thank you very much for Teresa and Enrique's comments. Thanks for that. And they helped me very much, even uh, at a semantic level. Thank you, because first of all, I know this is quite challenging and controverted, and uh, your point of view 
is very, very helpful to me. And to respond to Unai, Gasmude says that populist is an overused term. When he speaks about uh, thin ideology, he also mentions that you need a hosting ideology. Populism in itself does not say anything. Uh, there is a term that could be used, which is national populism. And with that, we might solve some of the ideas you mentioned. Maybe we can bridge those comments. But uh, populism, uh, by some, some authors say that it takes some hosting or uh, socialist populism, nationalist populism, agrarian populism, which is the original one in the US. But he claims that that's a thin ideology that needs something else. And then the great replacement theory, that is uh, quite tricky. And it's very controverted. That's a consequence of the theory of threats, saying, listen, migrations are a threat, and they can be reproduced very fast and replace the uh, local population. I think that's a consequence of, of the theory of threats. Think. I wish to say, uh, insisting on, on the idea of typology of, of migrants, I think there, there should be um, one should be careful when, when defining migrants, referring to some of the provinces at least. I, I come from La Rioja myself, mm -hmm. and I know the kind of migration mm -hmm. that uh, has arrived there. Mm -hmm. If I compare it with the, and I'm talking only of those preventive provinces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, preventive pol policy uh, uh, provinces. If I compare that with Malaga, I know that in Malaga, many of the foreigners are not the same type of migrants of La Rioja or of Lerida, for that matter, mm -hmm. who are working people, mainly uh, or, or enormously in agriculture and, and also in, in, in other functions. But not uh, they are not tourist residents. Mm -hmm. As, as we can find in Malaga or in Granada, mm -hmm. in the thousands. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number of, of foreigners in Spain, one of the top groups is Britons, mm -hmm. people from, from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. They are not <coughs> perceived as a threat or as anything like that. Yeah. The idea of, of these parties, by the way, yeah. and I think this, uh, this should be stressed, is absolutely unbelievable, precisely in the Mediterranean basin, which has been historically a crossroads of civilizations and cultures. We've had Muslims mm -hmm. governing, ruling uh, this territory of the Spanish peninsula for um, eight, eight, eight centuries. Mm -hmm. And the, the lack of education, which is a, a, an important issue, uh, when, when thinking of, of this kind of uh, perception of the foreigner, uh, results of the, of, of the lack of awareness that we are a, a palimpsest mm -hmm. of layers of civilizations, mm -hmm. and we're all hybrid. I mean, I'm, I'm making the case because when you spoke about the, the theory of threat, I, I take the theory of threat in reverse. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel a threat when I see Vox around mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. or, or, this, or, or these or the other uh, you know, parties. Mm -hmm. But in that typology, as I was saying before, you should perhaps make uh, the difference and, and, and find out. I mean, in, in, a, in, in a small city like Logroño, there are about 4,000 Pakistanis. How come? I mean, you know, it's, it's unbelievable that they have arrived there. Mm -hmm. And the number of, in, in the first waves of Moroccans that arrived there, they're mostly um, assimilated people right now. That is another important point to, to be made. It is not the same. The type of migration before the, uh, the um, uh, technological revolution and the, the communications uh, revolution than, than now. I can tell you the first thing the Moroccan girls did when they arrived in my village, mm -hmm. in particular, in La Rioja, 
was to take the, the, the veil off and forget about it. Now they are seen by their grandmothers through the media from Morocco, and they have to keep it because, uh, you know, uh, we are being criticized if we don't wear it, and so on and so forth. I mean, they're more attached to the, their region like that. I mean, you can live, actually, these days, as a migrant in your own country through television networks, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Then the other idea, I see these parties as, as a clear contradiction of, uh, in terms of the success or failure of globalization. Globalization is a failure. Is a failure for them because that uh, they, they I mean they, they, they want to, to um, keep uh, self-contained in their own shell etc etc but the truth is that they have no qualms whatsoever to take their money to safe havens they have no qualms to use uh, Google Amazon Facebook Apple Microsoft they are very much globalized only for their own interests <laughs> That's, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And even if, if uh, I mean, the, even if they um, uh, preach that they are the pure, um, you know, representatives of the, of the nation, etc., etc., what they are is a bunch of hybrid people, like everybody else, mm -hmm. since Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, and there's no, no way to discuss this uh, uh, with, with, with science these days. And they will um, surrender to the oligopole of, of, the, of the big GAFA, GAFAM uh, mm -hmm. companies uh, with, with no problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So this, these are points that I wanted to, to make because, and the role of media as well, even the social media, because they convey the information worldwide and, or, or, or nation, nationwide, in this case, uh, making, as Goebbels did, a lie after being repeated 1,000 times becomes a truth. And, and, and it's not true. What, what they're saying is not true. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's perhaps a little ingredient you may add mm -hmm. to, to, your, to your points. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Muchas gracias, Jesús. Uh, Thank you very much, Jesus. I now give the floor to Camilo, number four. Javier, two things. First one, uh, first one is a comment, a comment, and the second one is a little help. First of all, congratulations for your presentation. I have loved it in in its contents and in its shape, and also congratulations for dealing with uh, this topic. It's a uh, uh, very um, it's here and now, and it's uh, very brave that you did so. My comment is that well, I see that political parties ha play different roles. On the one hand, a political party can be nationalistic, and on, it can also at the same time be populistic, or not, or other things on top of that. And that rationale goes beyond that divide um, you and I mentioned about left and right. Having said that, uh, populism, much has been written about populism, and it's uh, mentioned on the media very often, but there is a common thing, which is that there is a society that is split into different poles, that's the people versus the elite, and the people is a group that uh, is uh, below the elite, and they are dependent and subordinate to the elite. And then that's where a criticism jumps in. One is ideology. Does that not meet the uh, criteria that ideology have to need to have, which is coherence? And then another criticism mentioned, well, you mentioned Delaclos and Chantal Buffet. And uh, that is that these political parties, or these political figures, it is not that they are populists in themselves or because of their ideology, but rather because they um, have uh, a specific uh, strategy. 
And uh, like uh, Anna said, the attitude towards migrants can be very helpful. And the speech they use that there can be used with your quantitative data. You can use it as qualitative uh, information that can help you match. Thanks, Camilo, Eladio. I've been in the Council of Europe for working uh, on migrants in the Intercultural Cities program. And I believe that you can't push uh, push uh, push this far the uh, relation between migrations and radical uh, parties or ultra nationalists. I would say ultra nationalists. I would say very nationalistic. Two examples: we used to go to Switzerland, and the m most Swiss and most radical and most nationalistic countries were in La Vallée, which is in a place where they had never seen a uh, foreigner. If you go to Geneva, where two thirds of the population were not born in Switzerland, and it was a very multicultural city, no one had anything to say about foreigners because two thirds of it were from uh, foreign origins. That's it. And another case is the country I was born in. I was raised in in this in, in that, this country, and it was. Uh, very nationalistic country, and there were no migrants at all in the country I grew, which is this one. There were no migrants coming in. It was the other way around. It was 1.5 million uh, people from here that went to Switzerland, Germany, and other countries. So you need to apply this to a specific context. And another thing you find out when you speak with migrants is that this is not only in uh, ultra-nationalistic country, it's in every country. It's at every level of, of society, even in liberal uh, areas of society. They speak about the Moors and things like that. It is true that it is used by the most radical parties, but every society has a, some parts, a percentage of skinheads and tifosi and uh, football radical groups. If you say that in the Basque country there is a civic nationalism, it is very uh, much the opposite. Those ultra people living in the Basque country, it's not that they were beating uh, black people, it's that they actually killed everyone against their ideology 20 years ago. <coughs> And uh, compared to that, vo Vox are extreme, uh, are older people. So apart from what Theresa said, I know many people had to flee the Basque country because of the threats. So why aren't there any skinheads in the Basque country? They are all members of uh, Bildu. You have to look into that and uh, change those words because those words are heavy. Civic, calling that civic is, is, not, is not appropriate. It's not understandable. Using the European Parliament and, and the elections, I don't think it's a, a very good idea because there is a high abstention, a rate of abstention because people don't give it, they don't care. Abstention is at least 20% higher than in uh, national uh, parliaments. To, you have to put it into context. What, what's the divide in Italy between the north and the south? Because pe people in, this, in southern Italy are discriminated in the north. They feel they are discriminated in the north of their own country. So there, there, were, there are a few things. And I will finish with a quotation by Samuel Johnson saying that patriotism is the last refuge of the villains. Eladio, we don't have any more time, so we have to be fair with everyone. I'm just going to give the floor to the moderator of this panel. Anna, you have the floor, and then we have the break.
maybe a controversial point because uh, the title of uh, your presentation was a proposal actually to generate common spaces to combat ultranationalism. But my, let's say, final thought on this would be whether the European Parliament is actually a common space for ultranationalism. Mm -hmm. And does the ultranationalism is uploaded for the member states on the European level, mm -hmm. or does it also go from the European level to the national level? Mm -hmm. You remember Viktor Orban mm -hmm. when he said that he is the defender of European values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Ana, y muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Anna, and everyone for your participation. I know you would like to keep on working on that and making your own reflections and discussing further with them um, in order to clearly reflect this um, these are contributions in your paper, but we have to be fair with everyone. You have the same time, the same amount of time, so we have to really stop here. But I think this is very enriching. And so thank you, and now we'll break for coffee 25 minutes.